looking at Acts today. Thank you, Brother Joe, for that great song. That song was based on the book of Lamentations, where you'll find that scripture. Jeremiah, who was so broken about the fall of Jerusalem and the enemy taking over, wrote that book, Lamentations, to lament. He was just crushed. He went out and bought some land prior to that in hopefulness that one day Israel would return to that holy land. That land means a lot to the Jews. The Bible calls Jerusalem the city of David. And God gave them all the way up from the trees of Lebanon down to the river of Egypt, a little small stream from the Mediterranean Sea way over to the Euphrates River, to the Euphrates. And all those nations are in their land and they're still not happy. And uh, you say, preacher, you talk about that a, a lot. I do. I believe that God blesses those uh, I know that because Genesis says, I'll bless them that bless Israel and curse them that curse Israel. And if our church wants God's blessing, then we do the things God wants us to do. Number one is, is of course, preach the gospel, but be good to Israel and, and be good to the widows and the orphans. You know, I love the, some of the ministry outreaches we do. I love it that Harold's helping serve in, in the prison ministry all the time with their music and and I think Aubrey does homeless people, and, and we know that we support 20 submission families, and we gave the rescue mission a, a couple of good checks. And so God blesses us for doing that. Philippians 4 says, the church who takes care of missions, all their needs are supplied. Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs, Church of Philippi, because you gave to missions. And, and we, we take that out of context. God takes care of us as well. Doesn't Matthew 6 say, if we seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added unto us? You say, Pastor, are you going to preach? Yes, I will. Uh, and looking at Acts chapter 8, I told a story about a drunk last week. I thought, well, this would be another good week for a drunk story. <clears throat> Drunk's walking along. He's got one foot on the curb and one foot in the gutter. And he's just walking down the road like that. And the police comes over, pulls him over gets out and says, you're drunk. And he says, are you sure I'm drunk? He said, you're drunk. And they went back and forth. And finally, the man said, well, I'm glad I'm drunk. And he said, why would you be glad you're drunk? He said, I was beginning to think I was crippled. <laughs> I was given two joke books this year for Christmas. <laughs> if that's not a hint, I don't know what is. And it was my own son that gave them to me. Anyway, <laughs> we know that uh, to transition into this message, great persecution and great lamentation. We just talked about the book of Lamentations was, was wrought in the church because Stephen was stoned and the persecution was intense. But the joy was that preachers began to leave Jerusalem because of the persecution and the gospel spread all over and churches were, were, were started and it was just great. People were saved and healed and the result ended up being great joy. We talked about the transition period. Remember, this is a time when the Bible was not yet complete and the apostles were still living and using their supernatural gifts to reach the Jews who required a sign and were in that time period. And the Bible says, Jesus said in John 20, that he did miracles so that the Jews would believe. And so we're in that time period. We're in chapter 8, verse 9. Let's read these verses. If you have that, stand with me. We're not going to read all these. We're going to pick up. <clears throat> and there was great joy in that city. That's where we concluded last week. But whenever you have great joy, what happens? But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. I mean, he used magic as the, the Greek word of magi was the word magic. It's not the same as the Greek word for sorcery elsewhere. Here it's magic. And he used that. Anyway, I'm preaching. You need to sit down, don't you? Hold on. Let's pick up. Verse, verse 10. To whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And him that had regard because of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed, and that's a, a statement that can confuse you, we'll explain later. He believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. 
Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who were with them come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was take was fallen and for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast wrought that gift of God, which may be purchased of God may be purchased with money. God bless us <coughs> as we look in the book for a walk in the world that will understand and will make application to our life the words that you've given us today. We thank you for preserving your word for us that we can have the great message of your word in our hands. Bless now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Isn't that kind of how life is where everything's going just great? We have joy. Our prayers are answered. We have a good Christmas season. And then, bam, reality kicks in. We're back in our loneliness. We're back in our difficulty, our trials, our relationship issues, our financial issues, whatever. And that's just the way the enemy is. As soon as there was great joy, Simon comes along. And, of course, he's a sorcerer. He's a magician. And remember, the Bible forbids it, according to Leviticus chapter 20. The, the, the enemy is the father of lies. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. And the enemy is a father of life. He deceived Eve. The Bible says he deceives the whole world. He makes the gospel so, so difficult for people to understand. And yet, it's so simple. As you read the gospel of John and other places, it's simple to understand. But he makes it difficult. And he had controlled the people with this magic. Remember going way back in Exodus chapter 7. God said to Abraham, throw your rod down. It became a snake. And, and with that rod, he would perform all those plagues by the power of God. What did the magicians do of Egypt? They imitated him on a small scale, deceived people into thinking they had power. But theirs was a sleight of hand. It was magic. I remember years ago, I was working at a health spa. And now you probably want to think, well, he needs to go to one now. And I was a fitness instructor. And we had a chemical in our back room, and then we had some Clorox powdered form in our back room. And, uh, and I knew that if you put these two things together, they'd explode. And so I was uh, a little mischievous. I was still 19, and, I, and this was on Brainerd Road, and I threw some powdered Clorox, or, or chlorine, excuse me, on the floor of the thing. And I had a cup of that, and I was acting like I had water, and I called some of the guys back there. And I said, you know, I, I don't know what story I told them. I threw that, what they thought was water on that. And, thing all exploded, and, and they were like, how could you do that? What did you do? And uh, I don't know what I did, but I was deceiving them. And this is what was going on here. There was a sleight of hand magic, and here Simon was manipulating. All the people thought he was some great, great thing because he did that. And he bid, bewitched them for a long time. And the Bible says finally in verse 12, they believed. Uh, the preaching of Philip, they believed, and they were immersed. That's what the word baptizio means. They were put under the water. It doesn't mean being sprinkled. It means put under. We understand that's what the Greek word means. So he believes, and, and, uh, and then the Bible says the people believe. And then the Bible says Simon himself believed also. And that's confused a lot of people. A simple reading of your Bible. If you've studied this, you know that he was not born again at this time. In fact, uh, scholars pretty much agree that he wasn't born again. Of course, God knew his heart. Uh, the Bible says, the Lord knoweth them that are his, 2 Timothy 2, 19. But here, the Bible says he believed. Let me give you seven reasons we know he wasn't saved. First of all, Jesus discounted this kind of belief. Look at that, John chapter 2. John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verses 23 and 24. We're going to look up. Uh, that's the only passage we're going to look up today outside of our text. John 2, 23 and 24. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast, that, uh, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. So Jesus discounted this kind of belief. You see, there's a head knowledge. A lot of people have a head knowledge of God. Why you ask every cult, 
every false teaching, every organization that teaches a false thing about God? Do you believe in God? Oh, yeah. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, we believe in Jesus. But then you ask them about their born-again experience, and it's based on a work or a false teaching, and they don't say, well, I've repented of my sins and trusted Jesus. They got some false teaching. Well, I, one lady said, well, I took Mass faithfully every week for years and years. Well, I mean, you know, Eucharist is what some call it. The Lord's Supper is really good, and we do that around here, but it's never saved anyone. Others say, well, I've been, I was sprinkled as a baby. One guy said, well, you know, our family believes that if you sprinkle your children, that means they're going to come to know the Lord. Well, still need the Holy Spirit to convict them of their sin. They still need to repent and be saved, right? And so we understand that because we teach uh, salvation by faith plus nothing minus nothing here. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy saved us. Uh, for uh, great, By the grace of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, not of works, lest any man should boast. But anyway, Jesus discounted it. Second of all, the Bible says, by you their fruit, ye shall know them. And we see in Simon's life <clears throat> that there's not change. He wants his power. And a lot is written about that. A guy by the name of Justin Martyr, 100 years later, wrote about it and said he ended up being the leader of the Gnostics and a thorn in Peter's side. So history says that he never really changed. James 2, 19 says the devil believes on the, on the screen and trembles. Well, is the devil going to heaven? Has he been born again? Nobody believes. He knows God is real. In fact, everyone born in this world as a little child has a conscience. Tonight I'm preaching on the conscience. What is the conscience? We'll talk about it tonight. Everyone who's ever been born in this world has a conscience. And I've used this example. I'll use it again. Years ago, I was on an island in Panama with a guy, Dennis, Rasp Dennis Rasmussen. He's, he's on the Discovery Channel from time to time. He's pretty old now. He's older than I. But, and I spent a day with him out there, and we cooked on a fire and had good talk. And he knew I was a minister, and he had questions. And we were going back and forth about DNA and all that way back. I gave him a great book, Evidence, A Theory and Doubt, based on DNA. And I gave that to him and tried to witness to him. But he's arguing. There, there's no difference than us and the other primates, he said. A little while later, he's telling me a story. And this is what I think I shared with you. He's telling about a family of monkeys. He said the father walked over, grabbed the monkey out of the mother's arms, ripped the head off, threw the baby down, and sucked up the brains and threw the skull down. And I said, what did the other monkeys do? He said, at first, the mother squalled a little bit, and then she went back to normal. And I said, you know... <laughs> There's something wrong with that species when there's no conscience. You see, all of us today, even if you don't know God, you knew that was wrong. Without Scripture, there's no morality. Without Scripture, we don't know right from wrong. I, I was telling someone the other day, we are not a democracy, America. And everybody's looking up at me. You read our history and you read our Constitution, everything. The Bible says we're a republic. For the republic for which it stands. A republic is governed by laws. If we say we're a democracy, then mob rules. The majority always rules, and laws don't matter. And that's what's happened. I'm watching TV this week. And when you get old, you do, you do three things. You eat, sleep, and watch TV. Um, but um, <clears throat> I'm joking. And on came, I, I haven't seen many married couples kissing on TV on advertisements. Seldom do you see a married couple kissing. But they had an advertisement for some AIDS medication. Here two guys several times are kissing. I'm about to throw up. And I'm thinking, this is what's happened to our society. We say God doesn't exist. And the Bible says in the beginning, everyone's born with a conscience. And they believe uh, somewhat that there is a God and then we just ignore our conscience. It gets seared and our conscience is not relevant in our life anymore because we ignore it. And then we become people without a conscience and, and we become like the people described in Romans chapter 1. And I said to Dennis, Dennis, there's your proof that monkeys don't have a conscience because the other monkeys would then later produce monkeys with the same male monkey after he did that? It wouldn't work in our society because we have a conscience. Even as children, before we know God, we know right from wrong, don't we? Remember before you knew the Lord, you were five or you were six or whatever you were and you disobeyed mom and dad and you knew you were wrong. We'll talk about the conscience tonight because I'm way off the subject. But Peter, 
then goes on here in verses 18 to 23 to rebuke all this, and we're going to study that. But he rebukes this whole idea of, of uh, you know, him being saved. He says in verse 20, he says, uh, your money's going to perish with you. John 3, 16, same word, perish. And so he rebukes him. Also, we know that uh, he was still in bondage. Look at verse 23. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. So there's several reasons. Also, Simon in verse 24, he fears judgment. He remained a heretic. No change in his life. You see, a lot of people are like Simon. They believe right here. But there's never change here. When God, the metamorphosis takes place in our life, there's a supernatural change. We don't go become a butterfly, but we become a new creation. Because God changes us. We don't look any different on the outside. The change is within. And so here, Simon, he, uh, he, he, he wants this, this supernatural power, and he follows Philip, it says here in the text. He begins to follow Philip in verse 13. He believed, he followed Philip, he wondered, he noticed, he beheld, he, beheld, he noticed the miracles. And uh, so then we find here God speaks to Philip and they decide to move the angel of the Lord and they move toward Samaria. And of course, we know they have a work there. I was reading this this week, I thought it was interesting. We talk about Simon and magic and, and the enemy uh, living in Panama, I'd seen firsthand the evidence of demon possession. I mean, it's more prevalent over there because they're a little behind in some things and uh, they're fooled more by the enemy. I, I think we're more uh, saturated with Scripture in America. But in Africa, on the coast of Malabar, there's 4,000, over 4,000 temples dedicated to evil spirits. There's over 3,500 temples dedicated to false gods. And in the heart of the, the East Indies, men worship demons as deities, and they have for centuries. The Hindus do. They worship all these different deities, and people live in fear. And they teach that anyone can have demonic power, including poor people and people that don't have much. They can still cast spells on other people. So once in a while, a plague will hit the area, a natural disaster, a storm, a sickness, and the medicine man is called in. He comes in, and he figures out who's to blame, and he'll figure out this out, and he'll say, well, you know, it's Chuck there. Chuck's the reason, and they, they take Chuck out and either burn him or, or drown him. That's what they do, because the medicine man said he's the one. Innocent people are killed. Everybody lives in fear. Isn't that the way the enemy wants it, though? And when we yield to him, Chuck Swindoll said there's no truce in the invisible war, no rest and relaxation for, the, for Satan's army, and there's not for God's people either. We can't let our guard down. We can't let our guard down. We have to be careful all the time that we listen to the Lord and follow his word. So here in verse 14, the apostles come to Samaria. They follow Philip, and that's great support. Philip wasn't an apostle, he's a deacon. He baptizes, he does these things, and, and they're supportive. I love that. Now, it's interesting that John comes because remember what John wanted to do in Luke to the Samaritans. He wanted to burn them because they rejected Jesus. He didn't like those half-Jews. And so he certainly changed in time. And the Bible says here that, that they came and they followed uh, him down to Samaria to minister and we know that it says they laid hands on people. And the Bible says and who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as he yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they were immersed in water, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Now remember, this is still the apostolic era. You still see them laying hands on people for them to receive the Spirit. You don't see that after 1044 of Acts. You never see that in the New Testament epistles. The Bible tells us now, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. And then Galatians 4, 6 says, and because you are sons, sons, God has sent the Spirit into your heart. We don't tarry. They did in Acts 2, waiting for the power of the Spirit. We don't tarry. When we trust Jesus Christ, the Spirit is sent to our heart. Romans 8, 9 says, if any man hath not the Spirit, he's none of his. And 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us we're all baptized by one Spirit into one body. 
The moment you get saved, you're part of the family of God. Don't be isolationist. We're not the only Christians in Rossville. Christians all over this place. You can have some good relationships because you're part of the body of Christ. You're, you're a part with other people and from other denominations. If you think only Baptists are going to get to heaven, I have news for you. A lot of Baptists won't be in heaven because it's not about what denomination you are. It's knowing Jesus Christ. And so here uh, we know that uh, th th they're, they're laying hands on these people. And then in verse 18, drop down. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. He said, I want to be able to do that. Well, he had been a magician. Now he sees the real thing. He didn't want to continue with his magic because he saw something way more powerful. But his motives were wrong. His heart was wrong. And Peter lets him know. Give me also this power, verse 19. Give me this authority is what the word really, really means. The Greek word here is not dunamis, it's not dynamite. It's a word meaning authority. And let me say this too. When we look at words and their meanings, um, how words came to be, our word dynamite came from the Greek word dunamis. But when you receive the Lord in your life, it doesn't mean you're going to explode. If you're expecting that kind of experience, that's not what's going to happen. His power is supernatural. And it resides in you in the, in the form of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the person of the Holy Spirit, but don't expect that. Verse 20, but then Peter said unto them, all these great transitional words, transitional words, but Peter, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. You know, I've pastored over the years lots of people. In the military church, I pastored all, had six pilots in my church in Okinawa. You know, all of them had a lot of rank, made a lot of money. I've had a lot of commanders in my church, never had a general, had a full colonels, but never a general. But I have felt as a pastor, I could not cater to them or in the civilian churches I pastored to the wealthy any more than to anyone else in the church. I just think being a respecter of persons is wrong. And, and here, Peter told them, you, you, you know, you're going to perish, your money. Money's the root of all evil. How many times do we hear about churches where a wealthy person is part of the church? And boy, they run the church. We've heard that. It's not happening here, by the way, if you, where you're going with this pastor. I don't think we have anybody like that. But my point is this. We have to be governed by God's leadership, not, not by things and money and uh, <laughs> I joke with people. When I was in college, I was a senior, and uh, actually, as a newly newly married guy, and I'm, this is a joke, but my this the story's true. My pastor called, and said, "Would you like to be our youth pastor?" And I I, I didn't ever really want to be a youth pastor. I'd been one. Uh, I was one in, in a church as a volunteer, but I didn't feel that was my calling. I wanted to go to missions to military and. And he called, and I, I said, oh, well, that's interesting. I'll, I'll pray about it. He said, well, the pay is 70000 a year. And I said, Mary, go pack the bags while I pray about it. And <laughs> that's true, but I didn't tell Mary to pack the bags. I wasn't interested. And there's been times churches have, have contacted me, and I don't care. I, I, you, you must know I'm not here for the money. You were broke when I came. <laughs> Amen. But if money is the governing principle in our lives, something's wrong in our lives. If decisions you make are all about the dollar, you're making the wrong decision. I mean, we understand we have to pay bills. And we try to get raises and we try to, you know, work hard to pay our bills and set our future up. But we have to learn to trust in the Lord. If you're worried about your pension, you're sinning by worrying. Trust in the Lord. If you walk into God's house on Sundays and you're all down because you're struggling to pay bills, get up. Those bills are God's responsibility as much as yours. Unless you went out and got in debt and hurt yourself, I, I understand that's a different story. But most of you who struggle financially, you realize that, that God always takes care of your needs. He promises that. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, as I quoted earlier, and his righteousness. And he'll add all these things to you. What are the things? Food, clothing, and shelter. Here's a man who wanted this power. He was willing to pay for it. Peter wasn't going to have anything of it. He wasn't going to have a... He, he said, your money perish with you. And you're going to hell. Your heart's not right, verse 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right. 
That expression is used in the Old Testament several times, not having a part for people who don't know God. He said, you have no part in this. You see, he wasn't truly born again. He was looking for a prophet. Uh, there's, a, there's a preacher on TV. It really annoys me. <clears throat> he says, I've made many, many millionaires. People who give to my ministry become millionaires. And he's now written a book. You know, if you send X amount of money and I'll send you this book, How to Be a Millionaire by Giving to His Ministry. Well, when you study his ministry, his ministry is raising money for his ministry. They don't see people saved. They don't give to missions. It's all about giving money to him. He'll tell you how to make millions. That annoys me because preachers do the same thing. Some guys may be born again doing the same thing that Simon does here. I want the power of God. I'll pay good money for it. Listen, if you want the power of God, you yield to God. Quit looking at what you might get out of it. And uh, how many times have I, I've got a note here, twice in this auditorium, people came up to me who said, I want to be saved. And I said, I took them through the gospel salvation plan, and they prayed a prayer. Hadn't seen either of them back. A lot of times people are in, in, in trouble. They have problems. And, oh, well, I want to be saved today to get out of my trouble. But I'm not going to come to church. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm not going to do anything for God. I just want to get out of the trouble I'm in, so I'll make this decision for God. God sees right through that. Remember, he said in John, we read it earlier. A lot of them followed him because he could do miracles and what he could do for them, obviously. But God didn't commit to them because he knew their heart. Heart's just a metaphor for our inner man, our conscience, but our soul, our, the Bible even talks about our bowels. God knew them and didn't commit to them. Folks, if you're here today, God knows your heart. And he says to him, you know, you're in a, you're in a gall, a, 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 in gall, literally poison of bitterness. Moses in Deuteronomy 29 says bitterness is a result of idolatry. Bitterness is a result of sin. Every time you see someone who's bitter, now Simon's bitter, but I don't know the reason he's bitter, but I know he's got a lot of sin in his life. He wants power for the wrong reasons. But how many times have we see people eating up with bitterness? Eating up, why? They don't forgive. How many times did I talk about forgiveness? When I was here before, Joe and Shirley and others, so you talked about forgiveness like every service. I'd preach a different text, go right back to bitterness. Forgiveness because people don't forgive. They want forgiveness from God, but they don't forgive anyone else. And what does the scripture say? If you don't forgive others, he doesn't forgive you. A forgiving church, a church of grace, is what I want us to always be. Listen, you will get hurt. You will get hurt. People do you wrong, I understand that. But fear of judgment here. He feared judgment, but that's not repentance. Simon said, I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness. Peter said, in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, I pray that the Lord, that none of these things which you've spoken happen to me. He feared reprisal. He feared the judgment that Peter pronounced. But he never ever, we find, never find him ever repenting of his sin. I'm certain. I'm certain there are always people. The Bible said there'll always be tares amongst the wheat. There'll always be, always be wolves in sheep clothing, and church will always have wolves amongst the flock. And the devil will use them to try to stir up trouble. It's always going to happen. As long as the enemy, the prince and power of the air, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, he's going to hinder the church at every turn. You know what the Bible says? The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We're part of the body of Christ. And we know that we're on the victorious winning side. The enemy wants to destroy us. He'll bewitch. He'll, he'll use magic to deceive us. He'll do everything he can. He'll, he'll, he'll just hinder our walk. He'll blind us to salvation because he hates us. He hates Jesus Christ. Jesus said, don't be shocked if he hates you. He hated me. Don't be shocked if the world persecutes you. They persecuted me. Listen, in the last days, we need to stand 
on the Lord Jesus Christ, on his word, and stand against what's right. And we need to reach lost people in our world and quit getting caught up in all the things we're caught up in. More people are, money, a root of all evil, as I said earlier, more people are concerned about their money or, or their pleasure today than they're concerned about God. Seek first his kingdom. You live a righteous life, you'll never be forsaken. God will take care of you. Because he's God, and his word is always good. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for stories like this, sometimes difficult stories, because we see Simon, who had every opportunity, but could not get it clear in his head that it wasn't about power and money and impressing people. It was about changing, and he wasn't willing to change. God, you're the change maker because you sent Jesus Christ to change us. And I pray for those here today, and there may be some that say, you know, I'm, I, I'm somewhat like Simon. I, I'm, not cast, I'm not working magic, but, but I see some of the similarities in my life. I don't know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, I want change in my life, but I don't know if I'm willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And I need to take up my cross today and follow him. And I need to be a, a, a better person by living for Jesus Christ. And I don't know your hearts, but God does. I just pray, God, for these hearts that they'll be right. If there's anyone here not saved, they'll come forward to be saved as our altars are always open. Bless us now in Jesus' name.